shows you uh, from left to right range of discussion. And then you've got opinion A on top and opinion B at the bottom. And there's this point of no return. And this begins the taboo zone. The model above illustrates processes and structures you will often find. Very often, the public opinion forming process proceeds between two extremes, between the two positions of extremely pro and extremely contra an issue. In the case of war and preparing for war, this means the plea for deterrence and defense on one side and plea for nonviolent conflict transformation on the other. All decision-making processes usually come to a point of no return when the question is decided. The process that leads to this point is described in the first left-hand part of the graph above. From a certain point on, the discussion carries on, but it is never allowed to run into the zone that was created by the previous discussion. The debate may touch the border of this zone, but is not allowed to overstep the borderline of the taboo zone. Of course, the temptation of this exists for some people, but in public discussion, this must be continuously resisted. Whether the once achieved taboo zone cracks or remains resilient, and the possible impacts of this depends on the discussion. The graphs in our model are created randomly. The curve of the line symbolizes only the possibilities of movement between the two extremes of pro and contra, and later between the one extreme and the tabooed zone, as you can see on the right side of the graph. The most significant point of this model is the beginning of the tabooed zone. The graph needs to be read from the left to the right side. Thank you very much for listening. And welcome again to Global Peace Studies for Sustainable Development in Africa. Excuse me, some of the um, participants are saying they don't see the screen or the graph. Okay. I see, I, I apologize. I apologize for that. And uh, <clears throat> So you are welcome, let's please uh, proceed. And I'd like to invite uh, Nimla Gopal. Nimla, are you there? Can you hear me? Hello, Nimla. I saw her before, but I don't see her now. Oh, she's saying she, keep, she keeps on getting kicked out. I don't know why. Um, uh -huh. And she's saying her Wi-Fi is so weak on her side. So let's hope that she will be able to uh, overcome that and we can proceed. So I would like to take this opportunity now to welcome our speakers, David Cherry and Bill Ferguson. Nice to see you again. And uh, who would like to begin today with the presentation, please? You may share your screen if you wish. And uh, I hope also Clorit can assist us with that. Okay, uh, let me begin. Can you hear Thank me you. all right? Great. Yes, we hear you loud and clear. All right, um, Clorit, do you have the slides ready? Okay, first, uh, thank you for having me on again. We had a pretty interesting, fruitful discussion yesterday of the process of BRICS and the potential it holds for the future. I wanna extend that today, but let me begin with 
an expression of the problem that the world faces and then follow with the solution as represented by the activity of the bricks. You see on the screen there a picture of Henry Kissinger. Um, remember, as I described last week, he was the US National Security Advisor and US Secretary of State uh, in the late 60s and 70s. And he made population reduction in India, Brazil, Egypt, and Ethiopia, among other nations, a US national security priority. Now I wanna read you a quote that distills the essence of the problem that we have to overcome. In his book, The Price of Power, Seymour Hirsch describes a tense meeting in June 1969 between Henry Kissinger and Gabriel Valdez, foreign minister in Chile's Christian democratic government. The previous day, Valdez had caused a stir at the White House, a White House meeting of Latin American foreign ministers by complaining about the difficulty of dealing with the United States. President Nixon present at the session was irritated. The next day, Kissinger confronted Valdez at a private lunch, which Hirsch describes. The meeting was unpleasant. As Valdez describes it, Kissinger began by declaring, Mr. Minister, you made a strange speech. You come here speaking of Latin America, but this is not important. Nothing important can come from the South. History has never been produced in the South. The axis of history starts in Moscow, goes to Bonn, crosses over to Washington, and then goes to Tokyo. What happens in the South is of no importance. You're wasting your time. Valdez recalls, I said, Mr. Kissinger, you know nothing of the South. Kissinger answered, no, and I don't care. At that point, Valdez, astonished and insulted, told Kissinger, you're a German Wagnerian. You are a very arrogant man. Now, can I have slide two? So in contradistinction, I want to read excerpts from the plenary session speeches, peace speeches of the leaders of the BRICS nations, which demonstrates that indeed the global South is making history perhaps the greatest historical shift in 1,000 years, despite Kissinger and his co-thinkers who have gotten us into the current world's strategic and economic crisis. First, I'll quote South African President Cyril Ramaphosa. BRICS stands for solidarity and for progress. BRICS stands for inclusivity and a more just, equitable world order. We know that poverty, inequality, and underdevelopment are the biggest challenges facing humankind. Advancing the African agenda is a strategic priority for South Africa during its chairship of the BRICS. As nations of the world confront the effects of climate change, we must ensure that the transition to a low carbon climate resilient future is just, fair, and takes into account differing national circumstances. Peace and stability are preconditions for better, more equitable world. We are deeply concerned about conflicts around the world that continue to cause great suffering and hardship. As South Africa, our position remains that diplomacy, dialogue, negotiation, and adherence to the principles of the UN Charter are necessary for the peaceful and just resolution of conflicts. We are concerned that global financial and payment payment systems are increasingly being used as instruments of geopolitical contestation. We will continue discussions on practical measures to facilitate trade and investment flows through the increased use of local currencies. While firmly committed to advance the interests of the global South, BRICS stands ready to collaborate with all countries that aspire to create a more inclusive international order. 
now from Brazilian President Lula da Silva. It is unacceptable that global military spending in a single year exceeds $2 trillion. While the Food and Agriculture Organization tells us that 735 million people go hungry every day in the world. And I will add parenthetically that 40% of that $2 trillion is spent by the United States. The search for peace is a collective duty and an imperative for fair and sustainable development. It is very hard to combat climate change while so many developing countries are still dealing with hunger, poverty, and other violence. We need an international financial system that instead of fueling inequalities, helps low and middle income countries to implement structural change. External indebtedness constrains sustainable development. It is unacceptable that developing countries are penalized with interest rates up to eight times higher than those charged to rich countries. Liquidity and concessional financing must be expanded. Conditionalities must cease. We can offer our own financing options through the new development bank, all of them suited to the needs of the global South. I am certain that under the leadership of my partner, Dilma Rousseff, the bank will rise to these challenges. The creation of a currency for trade and investment transactions between BRICS members increases our payment options and reduces our vulnerabilities. Now, uh, remarks from President Vladimir Putin. He wasn't present, but he transmitted them by video. We are all united in our commitment to shaping a multipolar world order with genuine justice based on international law and in keeping with the key principles set forth in the UN Charter, including sovereignty and respecting the right of every nation to follow its own development model. We oppose hegemonies of any kind and the exceptional status that some countries aspire to, as well as the new policy it entails, a policy of continued neocolonialism. Let me point out that it was the attempts by some countries to preserve their global hegemony that paved the way to the deep crisis in Ukraine. Now some excerpts from the speech of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And we'll be hearing more from him later on. It is a matter of great pleasure for me and my delegation to be once again in the beautiful city of Johannesburg. This city has a very deep connection with the people of India and the history of India. Tolstoy Farm, at some distance from here, was built by Mahatma Gandhi 110 years ago. By combining the great ideas of India, Eurasia, and Africa, Mahatma Gandhi has laid a strong foundation of our unity and mutual harmony. Modi proposed, <clears throat> and this is me speaking, Modi proposed increased cooperation in the fields of science in general and particularly in space. So this is Modi again. We are already working on the BRICS satellite constellation. Taking it a step further, we can consider creating a BRICS space exploration consortium. Under this, we can work for global good in areas like space research and weather monitoring. Then later, the countries of the global South have been given a special importance in BRICS under the chairmanship of South Africa. We heartily uh, welcome this. This is not only the expectation of the present time, but also the need. India has given top priority to this topic under its G20 presidency. Then finally, we have Chinese President Xi Jinping. Development is an inalienable right of all countries, not a privilege reserved for a few. We BRICS countries should be fellow companions on the journey of development and revitalization and oppose decoupling and supply chain disruption 
as well as economic coercion. We should expand political and security cooperation to uphold peace and tranquility. The Cold War mentality is still haunting our world and the geopolitical situation is getting tense. All nations long for a sound security environment. International security is indivisible. Attempts to seek absolute security at the expense of others will eventually backfire. International rules must be written and upheld jointly by all countries based on the purposes and principles of the UN Charter, rather than dictated by those with the strongest muscles or the loudest voice. Ganging up to form exclusive groups and packaging their own rules as international norms are even more unacceptable. We need to fully leverage the role of the new development bank, push forward reform of international financial and monetary systems, and increase the representation and voice of developing countries. I'm glad to see the growing enthusiasm of developing countries about BRICS cooperation, and quite a number of them have applied to join the BRICS cooperation mechanism. We need to act on the BRICS spirit of openness, inclusiveness, and win-win cooperation to bring more countries into the BRICS family so as to pool our wisdom and strength to make global governance more just and equitable. As an African proverb puts it, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. The philosophy of Ubuntu, which believes that I am because we are, highlights the interdependence and interconnectedness of all peoples. Similarly, harmonious existence, harmonious coexistence has been the aspiration of the Chinese nation for thousands of years. I would encourage everyone to read the speeches in full as much as you can. Uh, I'll, I'll put in the, ch the chat later a link so that you can read some of the uh, excerpts that we have published as well as some articles uh, on the theme of what happened in the BRICS conference. Now again, returning to my theme, the historical change being created by the Global South. As you know, with the Ch Chandrayaan-3 mission, India is the first nation to reach the South Pole of the Moon. So much for Henry Kissinger saying that history never comes from the South. Now, can I have slide number three? Now, this is a, that you see uh, Modi and representatives on the right from the uh, Indian Space Research Organization. And as the BRICS conference proceeded, Chandrayaan-3 landed on the South Pole of the Moon. And these are excerpts from his remarks to the ISRO and to the world. I find them very inspiring. Friends, on this joyous occasion, I would also like to address all the people of the world, the people of every country and region. India's successful moon mission is not India's alone. This is a year in which the world is witnessing India's G20 presidency. Our approach of one earth, one family, one future is resonating across the globe. This human centric approach that we represent has become, has been welcomed universally. Our moon mission is also based on the same human centric approach. Therefore, this success belongs to all of humanity, and it will help moon missions by other countries in the future. I am confident that all countries in the world, including those from the global south, are capable of achieving such feats. We can all aspire for the moon and beyond. My dear family, when we see such history being made in front of our eyes, life becomes blessed. 
such historical events become the living consciousness of national life. This moment is unforgettable. This moment of victory of the victory cry is the victory cry of a developed India. This moment is the triumph of the new India. This moment is about crossing the ocean of difficulties. This moment is about walking on the path of victory. This moment holds the capability of 1.4 billion heartbeats. This is a moment of new energy, new faith, and new consciousness in India. This is a moment of invocation for India's emerging destiny. What we dreamt on earth, we implemented on the moon. Can I have slide number four, please? Now I want to indicate how this is reverberating around the world. And this is, uh, uh, indicates the uh, response to what India accomplished uh, is expressed by President Lula in Brazil. Last Tuesday, in a conversation with the president, which is broadcast every week, Lula uh, re recounted a conversation that he had with President Modi. I spoke to President Modi, the prime minister of India, and congratulated him on the rocket launch. They started launching rockets at the time Brazil was building its space base, okay? Brazil, since it didn't have the necessary investment, is where it's at, and it didn't go any further. What he told me was exceptional. They have 100 schools, 100 schools, where kids are studying and making rockets. And these rockets will all be launched into space by the students themselves. I was amazed. I was amazed because it's not one school, it's 100 schools, because they invest a lot in science. They invest a lot. And this is something we need to do here in Brazil because we also have many, 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 many people who are geniuses. We just need to give them the opportunity to flourish. In the same broadcast, Lula announced that Brazil is building a second campus of its National Aeronautics Techno uh, Technology Institute in the Northeastern state of Ceará, one of the poorest states in Brazil. He said, the way for us to reward the state of Ceará is to bring an extension of ITA there so that we can train geniuses. And then uh, one more contribution from Prime Minister Modi. This is uh, from an interview he did with Press Trust of India last week. A GDP-centric view of the world is now changing to a human-centric one. The shift to a human-centric approach has begun globally, and we are playing the role of a catalyst. India's G20 presidency has also sowed the seeds of confidence in the countries of the so-called third world. For a long time, India was perceived as a nation of over 1 billion hungry stomachs. But now, India is being seen as a nation of over 1 billion aspirational minds, more than 2 billion skilled hands, and hundreds of millions of young people. Referring to India's centennial coming up, he went on. The period till 2047 is a huge opportunity. Indians who are living in this era have a great chance to lay a foundation for growth that will be remembered for the next 1,000 years. By 2047, I am sure that our country will be among the developed countries. Our poor people will comprehensively win the battle against poverty. Health, education, and social sector outcomes will be among the best in the world. And then in closing, Modi described the model which can be a guiding path in the world. Sabka saath, sabka vikas, sabka vishwas, meaning together for everyone's growth with everyone's trust. Now in conclusion, 
three points I'd like to make. I hope you found those excerpts as inspiring as I did. This is the future. This is history in the making by the global South, by the global majority. Uh, I wanna invite you, number one, to participate in a conference that the Schiller Institute uh, will be holding uh, Saturday, uh, September 9, uh, at 9 Eastern Daylight Time. The title is, Let Us Join Hands with the Global Majority to Create a New Chapter in World History. So that's this Saturday coming up, and you can register at the SchillerInstitute.com site. I'll, I'll put in the chat the, uh, the link. I also want to encourage you to sign a petition that we're circulating, the appeal to the citizens of the global north. We must support the construction of a new just world economic order. Now, something that's developed recently that I should bring your attention to, I, I won't elaborate further, but we can take up some of it in the discussion period. There is, a, as you know, six new countries were invited to join the BRICS among them Argentina. And Argentina is being targeted to prevent them from joining the BRICS. They have an election coming up October 22nd. There's massive financial warfare being used against Argentina. They have something, I believe, like $46 billion in debt to the International Monetary Fund. And the noose is being tightened around their neck so that to destabilize the government and the economy of Argentina, uh, uh, which the result could be that the uh, next government will be uh, that of uh, the candidate Mila, who has said that if he's elected, he will make sure that Argentina does not join the BRICS. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll put in a link with some information about that as well, and we can take it up if you like. And just finally, um, this is the history being made, despite Kissinger, despite those that want to, to talk about a rules-based order that has nothing to do with international law and has nothing to do with the aspirations of humanity. Myself, working in the LaRouche organization and in cooperation, with the Schiller Institute of Helga Zepp LaRouche, we want the BRICS to succeed. We, uh, I'm based in the US, Mrs. LaRouche is in Germany, but this is not just a priority for the lesser developed countries, the global South, the global majority. It is a priority for all nations of the world that the BRICS succeed. So I have to thank you for giving me an opportunity uh, to speak with you on this, and I look forward to the further presentations and the Q&A. Can't hear you, George. No. George, you need to unmute. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> you're, you're muted again. You're still muted. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Bill Ferguson, for this uh, wonderful presentation. History is in the making in the global south. And I would like now to invite uh, David Cherry to please um, make your presentation. Afterwards, we'll have the Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muzalemwa. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to be here. And thanks to you and to, to the, the listeners. Um, the question is, what can BRICS do for Africa? Uh, and I'm going to address that from an unusual 
standpoint. Uh, is, is there a pathway for for uh, by which a country can really develop and industrialize? Well, there, apparently there is. China lifted 850 million people out of the, the, the worst poverty uh, in, in just less than three decades. What happened? How did they do that? Let's go to uh, to uh, American history to shed some light on that. There was a time it, uh, when our country, the United States, was not only not imperialist, but it was anti-imperialist. After all, our revolution was a head-on confrontation with the British Empire. Um, and, and so part of that American story is that um, our first Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, uh, built, building upon some earlier thinkers, uh, developed a, a, a system of thought about national economics, which uh, has uh, which took wings both within America and and worldwide and. Uh, let, let's see what he proposed. In order to have sovereignty, the a nation must have some some degree of, of power. Um, and and to, to to make that happen, the government should have a role in the economy, uh, not to run it, uh, not Soviet style. Planning and management, but but must guide it. Uh, and this this is done through a national bank. Alexander Hamilton founded the first uh, uh, bank of the United States. The national bank is not beholden to finance capitalists. Uh, neither is it purely the creature of the government, because it would become just a political tool in that case. So uh, the National Bank has a board of directors that is composed of both private sector representatives and government representatives. The purpose of the bank is to invest in projects that will promote the general welfare, including scientific and technical endeavors, example, agro-industrial technologies or space exploration. Uh, it must also invest in infrastructure and in um, health and and so on. Now, the bombshell is that the in this system, the, the government can create credits for for these projects, for these national projects, by the stroke of a pen. One doesn't have to go to the banks and say, "Will you loan us money?" If if there's the, the real backing for this for this credit is the knowledge that the population has this the skills uh, and the discipline to carry through these projects which once they are completed they they pay pay for themselves in terms of the of the advance of the national economy so the, the national government i mean the national bank um, creates credits and that allows contractors to be to be paid to um, to carry out these projects. There's a, there's a strict separation of financial speculative enterprises from commercial banks. The speculative enterprises are not allowed to to also parade as a commercial bank. Either you're going to develop the physical economy uh, and, and be a part of this national banking process or or else uh, you're out on your own as far as, as far as carrying out speculative activity. There must be protection for infant industries. There may be capital controls at, at times to prevent the outflow of capital that's needed at home. 
the bank will foster a high wage policy? Yes, high wage policy. Why? Because unless the the, the the worker is paid well for his work, there's there's no hope of of his self development and of the the, the self development of his children. And that is the the self development of the individual is 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 the foundation of the entire economy. So th these principles are all quite the opposite of the British economics of Adam Smith. It's not an accidental that uh, the Adam Smith's famous book, uh, Wealth of Nations, was published in 1776. That was the year of the American Revolution. Adam Smith and the British knew where we were going. So what happened? Uh, we, we had uh, a rocky ride because uh, even though we defeat, defeated the British, we had uh, pl plenty of people here who still uh, sh uh, shared the, the view on economics of the British. So we had a first national bank, <clears throat> and when his charter expired, we had a second national bank, um, and um, then we had a president, Andrew Jackson, who who, who hated the whole idea and and uh, uh, ended the, sec the second national bank. But when it, when these banks were effective, they they showed their worth. Now we get to the 1860s when Abraham Lincoln was president. He had to fight the Civil War to keep this nation together. Otherwise, we would wind up with a southern tier that was a separate state supported by the British and, and uh, based, based on slavery versus a north that was industrial and, um, and not based on slavery. Well, there came a time during the war when uh, there was a problem of finance. The, the banks in New York City were not on Lincoln's side. Lincoln was hated in New York. Lincoln issued greenbacks. The greenback is the is the is the money that is 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 fiat money by the stroke of a pen to fight the Civil War, and won it. He, Lincoln la launched the first transcontinental railroad. There was no private firm that would have done it on its own. Obviously, they came in as contractors. So this, this system was working. Um, now, the, the, um, the advocates of this system, uh, I mentioned Alexander Hamilton, uh, that they later included Henry Carey and his father, Matthew Carey, uh, and uh, also Friedrich List, a German who came to the United States and was here for many years. Um, so the the uh, think these thinkers thought, well, we need to give this to the whole world. It's not this is not something that's just for us. We, we want to be in a world that's that's, that's also de developing nicely. So um, in in 1868, this is right after Lincoln was assassinated in 65. So um, in 1868. Uh, there was an earthquake in Japan, and a political earthquake, because Japan for 200 years had had, had a figurehead uh, for an emperor, and well, really, people who held the power were the were the uh, warlords, always fighting each other. So, in 1868, the the the, uh, uh, in, the emperor was put back in power. This is called the Meiji Restoration because that emperor was the the Emperor Meiji, uh, and um, one of the American system advocates, Erasmus Peshein Smith, uh, was in Japan starting in 1871. He was there for five years. He was a, a student of, the, uh, of, as I said, of the American system. And he talked to people at court. He, he, he talked them how the system worked. They adopted it. That's why Japan rapidly industrialized in the, within a space of about 30 years. Uh, 
at about the same time, uh, well, it was in Germany. Uh, Germany was united by Bismarck in 1871, um, immediately following the the uh, uh, Franco-German War. Uh, and there was a member of the German parliament named Wilhelm von Kardorf, uh, who had, had read the Friedrich List book about the system, List being the, the one, the German who was in the United States working with the, with the, uh, with the Carries. Um, and Kardorf had access to, to Bismarck and had many conversations with him. And Bismarck had been a strong advocate of, of uh, the free market. Uh, you don't want tariffs, you just let commerce uh, go the way it goes. Kardorf persuaded him that, th that this was not going to develop Germany. So uh, in 1879, Bismarck announced his new program and that included protective tariffs for infant industry, uh, the, the, they, they created a, a uh, customs union, and there was under Bismarck a lot of railroad building, and and so again the system worked. Um, okay, now let's fast forward. Excuse me. All this time, China was a desperately poor power. It had been exploited uh, by, especially the British, but really by all the powers, all the European powers. Um, and so eventually there was a revolution or two revolutions or, um, and the, the communists came to power in 1949. Um, Mao's policies were were variable. They they were often extreme. He died in 1976. His successor, Deng Xiaoping, uh, who was firmly in the saddle by 1978, um, was was aware of what had happened in Japan. A century early, more than a century earlier, and Deng and his associates translated the uh, the, the book that the book that Friedrich List had written from J Japanese. I mean, originally it was in German, but it was translated to Japanese. They got it into the book into Chinese. And that was the basis, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, the uh, American system of economics was the basis on which China was able to lift those 850 million out of the worst poverty. Helga zeppler Rouge uh, came to Beijing in uh, 1993. Uh, she'd been in China before, uh, but uh, in this case, she was going at the invitation of the government um, and ha had conversations about this very these very same principles. Um, and so it, it, privately, it was expected that China would would announce uh, the new policies it sees in 1997 that actually the uh, uh, the, the, the uh, belt and road policy, but there was a um, the so-called Asian financial crisis in that year, and they, they postponed it. All right, in 2013, it, it was uh, uh, President Xi Jinping who announced it, and so th that's the, that's the continuity, um, and and so we know what the principles are. And the point, the question now is, can African nations implement these principles? Well, 
that's a, a, a difficult question because the the, um, the Anglo-American powers are running such, so many operations against adopting those those principles that it's really imp almost impossible. It is impossible with uh, unless there is a combination of nations that backs you up. And I, I submit to you that the BRICS is that combination. Um, I, I could say a lot more, uh, but I think I, I'll, uh, in my narrative there, I have four slides that relate to some questions that uh, arose in our last session. Um, and I wonder if we could have the first slide. Oops. Uh, can we have the first slide, please? I, uh, the first slide is, is actually a, uh, a text, so I can just read that. The, um, I was referring to the, the Anglo-American powers uh, running operations to prevent countries from developing. Uh, and here we have a quotation from Klaus Schwab, founder and CEO of the World Economic Forum. Um, and he explains, why Africa must never be allowed to develop. Uh, he, he didn't use those words, those are my words, why Africa must never be allowed to develop. But here are his words. He said, the same force that helps people escape from poverty and lead a decent life is the one that is destroying the livability of our planet for future generations. The emissions that lead to climate change are not just the result of a selfish generation of industrialists or Western baby boomers. They are the consequence of the human desire for a better future for oneself. And that's from his book uh, published 2021 called Stakeholder Capitalism, page 154. Now, just to just say it very briefly, why why are are there uh, is, the, is there this desire to prevent Af African and other nations from developing? The, the answer is that they, the old families, the old oligarchical families, some of them uh, ro royalty and, uh, or other aristocracy, that they're threatened by the they they have power even even aristocratic families that are you know that are not uh, very much most of the families are not in the news uh, but they they have money but even more important than that they have they have power and they, they don't want to lose it they they've been running the world they think they're entitled to run the world and uh, the a rising number of of a rising percentage of the world population that is educated and uh, and uh, has a de decent living standard. People like that are have opinions and views, and they can think things through for themselves. No, this is not good. <laughs> so you know, it's this is targeting not just Africa and, and other developing countries. They they want to to reverse industrialization itself worldwide. Actually, okay.
Um, I'm just touching on a couple of points here that came up uh, last time. The, the, what what Schwab is talking about the the threat to of uh, of climate change, global warming, that is a hoax. It was invented in the 1970s uh, as a way to to sell the, the program of of reversing industrialization and reducing uh, reducing the population from 8 billion people to one. And, and most of the people who were talking about this are we're talking about reducing to 1 billion people. Now, here's a map that shows that, that uh, uh, well, it's, first of all, there's certain things that are true. The, the amount of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere is growing. That's true. Uh, let's go to the green one, yes. Um, and from 1982 until 2015, uh, the uh, this, this carbon, increasing carbon dioxide has been having beneficial effects because carbon dioxide is the is the, the fuel for plant growth. If you know anybody who has greenhouses and is growing flowers or vegetables for sale in, in greenhouses. Many of them are actually injecting carbon dioxide into the greenhouse. So the green, deep green part of on this map are areas where the the leaf, the total leaf area seen from um, uh, satellites has increased over this period. Um, okay, now let's go to the next slide. Yeah, is nuclear power safe? Uh, <laughs> this this is the death rate per unit of electricity production from one uh, technology to another. Brown coal is obviously not very very good. Coal, uh, coal is shown as better here, uh, and then way down toward the bottom of the list. We have nuclear, one of the safest. <laughs> um, so th this tells you that your that was reported in, in the newspapers is skewed. If, if, this, if somebody stubs their toe at a nuclear power plant, it's on the newspapers. But meanwhile, you've got a some conventional coal power, power plant or some, some other plant. Uh, where, where there's a big accident, people die, and it's not in the papers, or it's not very much in the papers. Okay, the final slide, please. Yeah, so even concerning coal, um, that long bar of, of showing that uh, there's greater risk in coal-fired uh, fired plants is would be a shorter if advanced coal burning technologies were used. I'll just read this. South Africa still has about a century's worth of coal. There have been significant improvements in the technology. The coal is sprayed into boilers now, finer than talcum powder. It's not like the old steam locos where a fireman shoveled in lump, lumps of coal. It's ground up and sprayed into the fine powder. That enables you to have a very high temperature and a very fast burn which results in greatly reduced air pollution. It's the H-E-L-E process, I guess you'd say, Healy. A high energy, lower emissions, and then electrostatic precipitation in the exit stacks removes most of the remaining particulate matter. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's from Kelvin Kim, the South African physicist and engineer. Um, and uh, EIR has published a lengthy interview with, with him and. Uh, this quotation is combined, uh, a combination of an excerpt from that interview with, with some uh, conversation I've had with him since. So um, <laughs> I hope I haven't moved too, too rapidly over, over too much territory, but I'll leave it there. <laughs>
Thank you so much, uh, David Cherry, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, it's uh, now time to answer that question whether, uh, what can BRICS do for Africa? Uh, and also definitely what can Africa do for BRICS? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I would like to invite uh, people to uh, ask questions. You may raise your hand or even put your question in chat. Uh, I can see Afiz. You are welcome, Afiz. Please. Afiz. Thank you for this opportunity and I really appreciate the board with presenters from the Ferguson to David Sherry, which take us to the historical development. So my question is uh, for Ferguson, I will be asking, what are the progress that the, uh, the new development bank since the establishment, since the establishment, I think 2015 or so. What is the progress that you have marked on the big? Because I can still notice that you are still running on dollar. And that was, was, that was one of my questions last week, that what are you doing about the convertible currency that the BRICS want to be using? And the second question is that, now that we have five countries on the BRICS, which form the world BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa. Because I noticed that in 2009, that BRIC was established, it was BRIC without the S. But when South Africa joined the following year, you added the S. Now that many countries are now interested in joining, I try to rephrase the name of the BRICS, just as the way you rephrase the BRIC Development Bank to New Development Bank. That's the second question. And the third question goes to the um, uh, David Sherry. What are you trying to put in place for Africa that has commodity goods, because if Africa has commodity goods and we are being exchanging with uh, the currency that does not belong to Africa, what solution are you trying to re render to Africa in order to make their own currency to be more valuable or to be among one of the comfortable currencies in the world? Then in addition to my question, sorry, to the first three, first two questions, is that, is there any plan by the new development bank to try to remove the conditions of IMF and the World Bank given to Africa in borrowing money? Then is there any other, is there any plan for the payment or try to erase the debt on the neck of most African countries? Thank you. Okay. Uh, when the BRICS Bank was formed, I believe it was in 2014 at Fortaleza in Brazil, the idea was to create a fund of $100 billion equivalent for the uh, development of the uh, Global South nations. Now, during the period up to now, I, I don't know the exact figures, but I know that the plans that were announced in Johannesburg represent extension of credit equal to the amount that was extended during the entire period uh, up to this year. In other words, they're going to lend out more than was lent up to now by the new development bank. I think that has something to do with uh, Dilma Rousseff's uh, pres presidency of the uh, new development bank. Um, it also has to do with, uh, as you mentioned, uh, 
de-dollarizing the process. She specified in the uh, presentations that she gave in Johannesburg that, first of all, the conditionalities are not going to exist, that the loans are going to be for development. And you cannot have actual development if there are conditions imposed on the borrower that prevent them from actually investing the money to develop. Uh, if we just, I had mentioned the, the problem in Argentina. They owe $46 billion to the IMF. And virtually none of that money that was borrowed by Argentina went into investment in economic infrastructure, industrialization, modernization. It went to pay off loans from 40 years ago. You know, if, if you say you're lending to a country and instead it, and the country takes it, the government takes it, and then it ends up in the hands of international bankers, uh, that's not development. So as she said, there are going to be no conditionalities imposed, no requirements of budget targets and austerity. The, the, the metric is going to be progress on the actual development goals, building the infrastructure, investing in the science, inve investing in the modernization. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was mentioned by David as the, the founder of the American system, one of the founders of the American system of economics. And that was a requirement. You don't lend money to make, well, human, human beings don't lend money in order to create a dependent that's what loan sharks do, and that's what uh, colonialists do. I mean, that's that's the policy of uh, empires. Humans lend money; they create credit, always with the it, the goal of the extinguishment of the debt. That by lending, the borrower can invest to improve its productivity, to expand its production, to create products and services that generate actual physical, tangible wealth and improvement of standards of living, which increases the income, which creates the, creates the basis for which the loan can be paid back. That's the principle that's operating uh, with the new development bank. In terms of the de-dollarization, it was mentioned, I, I don't remember the exact location, but I'm going to post uh, a link to a, uh, a package of articles about the uh, BRICS conference, which will have the answer in it. Um, the, um, the, in order to raise money to, uh, for, for the uh, uh, new development bank, They'll be issuing bonds, and they're going to be accepting, uh, you know, the bonds will be purchased uh, with local currencies. There's going to be more emphasis on the rupee and the rand and the real and uh, the renminbi and eventually the, ru the, uh, the ruble. One of the problems with the investment that, that occurred during two, uh, 2022, 2023 were, uh, well, of course, the COVID crisis, but also economic sanctions. This is another way around that. And let's not, let's also uh, not forget that BRICS is expanding. And some of the countries that have joined BRICS, for example, well, Iran, first of all, they've been an international pariah <laughs> for uh, quite a while. They're not going to submit to any, uh, I mean, they've been subjected to economic sanctions probably more than any other country, except maybe Russia, I don't know. But uh, they're not going to kowtow to any uh, conditionalities or restrictions on them. Iran, United Arab Emirates, and of course, Saudi Arabia, together with Russia, that's four of the greatest oil producers in the world. They are part of BRICS now. So when they are uh, selling oil, and by the way, the, 
two two largest consumers of their of the oil are China and India, who are also in the BRICS. So between Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Iran, and Russia as producers and sellers, and India and China and others as buyers, what does this have to do with the U.S. dollar? I don't think it's warfare against the dollar. I think it's the the system with it has the dollar operating as the reserve currency has been is not been it's been rigged against the global majority against the global south and we saw it particularly nasty in afghanistan seizing assets who wants to deal with a system that uh, will starve it to death so that's the point of, of of the new development bank it's not warfare against the dollar its investment to develop nations that aren't being developed by the current system. So that's why you have to create an alternative. Now I may have, uh, there might have been another question that was directed at me, but uh, I don't remember all the ones that you raised, but maybe I'll give David a chance to respond to what you're saying, what you had asked. Sure. Um the question was, what, what will support the, the national currencies of African countries? And the answer is that the, a currency is, su is supported by, by the productive activity of, of, of that national economy. Um, and the, the BRICS can provide a, a degree of, of, of political protection uh, and that that allows a, a, a the government to, to to foster its own physical economy. Um, as far as handling the debts, the existing debts that countries have to the IMF, I'm not aware of any 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 plans at the BRICS level to to deal with those debts. Obviously. The, with the, the uh, new development bank, the idea is not to take any more debts from the IMF um, and possibly the World Bank either. And um, the, the 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 advances of, of of African economies will produce the wealth to 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 pay off the old debts. And if there's something else that can be done, like a debt moratorium or debt cancellation, even by virtue of kind of political political clout, then bring it on. Let's do that. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed. And let me go to say Anya and then Richard Sean. Say, please, would you like to ask your question or make a comment? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, from George, um, I want to thank all the the presenters of today for the awesome presentation, uh, which is very inspiring. To this, I have uh, two questions that I want to uh, put forward to any of the presenters. One of them is uh, the fact that BRICS has been existing for more than 15 years. And of course, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa have been in this relationship. Um, I haven't yet noticed that there has been some equitable relationship in between them because um, of the fact that if they want to equally relate with each other, it means that <clears throat> like the saying goes, you have to teach someone how to catch fish and not give someone fish all the time, which means that we would have seen the uh, less developed countries that are in that relationship to be of the same 
capability as far as technology is concerned, as far as the transfer of knowledge and industrialization techniques between those countries are concerned, which brings my worry to the relationship that exists between these countries. Now, secondly, uh, <clears throat> how uh, can we make sure that BRICS is promoting the principle of nature, spirituality, and peace in the world instead of the principles of theocracy, politics, and wars, because the war is at a point where we need peace. We need, uh, uh, like uh, the chair lady of the Shila Institute say, that the new form of collaboration is uh, development or peace is development. How can we achieve development when we're still politicking, we're still doing policies that are anti-human? These are my questions for now. Thank you, Comrade. Thanks for asking that. Um, that's what we're gonna take up in our conference on Saturday. Um, last year, I believe it was uh, November 22nd, Mrs. Helgazep LaRouche statement called 10 Principles Development and Security Architecture. And she put those two concepts together. You can't have security without development. And you can't have development without security. And as was mentioned by uh, President Ramaphosa in his remarks and Xi Jinping, uh, I, my memory that maybe others took it up in their remarks, stability and peace are requirements for economic development. And the reverse is also true. Now, the fact that if, if you look at the BRICS, the, there's very diverse nations and some of them have disputes, historical disputes. Um, in fact, the enemies of the BRICS concept are trying to use those differences to enhance, to, to sabotage cooperation. We know that, I, I mentioned that Argentina is under assault to, to prevent Argentina from joining the BRICS. The same is happening with regard to Saudi Arabia. Um, the United States is trying to convince Saudi Arabia not to participate in the BRICS process. Now, think about the fact that two of the nations that are joining the BRICS or that have been invited to join the BRICS, it's not all a done deal, are Iran and Saudi Arabia, who did not have diplomatic relations until the Chinese uh, offered their services to bring them together. Now, and now they, they have relations. I think that's a good example of what can be accomplished when you have the, 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 the principle of win-win cooperation in mind and stability in mind. There was a principle, uh, well, let me go back a little historical reference. The 30 years war was 30 years of people who both, both sides considered themselves Christian. And they were committing murder and atrocities against each other for 30 years. They said they believed in the same God and Jesus Christ as their savior and they're slaughtering each other. They came to the conclusion that if they didn't solve this problem, there'd be nobody left. So they uh, created the peace of Westphalia. One of the principles of the peace of Westphalia is the advantage of the other not just, oh, we'll make a deal so that we don't die and you don't die. No, you have to actually have the, the best interest of your adversary as a motive for negotiation and for relations. 
uh, and this is a successful idea. Now, I, I've, I raised this last, last week. If the United States and the United Kingdom, NATO, are committed to destroying Russia, and they've made it clear, this has been made clear, they promised in uh, 91 that NATO wouldn't move one inch to the east. Well, it's moved about, I believe, 600 miles to the east. The United States sponsored a coup in Ukraine, next door neighbor to Russia, a, a country that's been intimately tied with Russia for thousands of years to foment a, a, to, a, a, a revolt that kicked out the democratically elected president under the Russian regime. That was done by the United States and NATO. We, you know, we have the recordings of uh, Victoria Nuland talking about who's going to run Ukraine. That's not in the service of peace. Now, ultimately, if the human race to survive, there has to be peace negotiated. And somebody has in the chat, what about uh, Israel in the Saudi Arabia, Iran, China, et cetera? Same thing. You can't have a commitment that says, oh, look, this is our territory. This is our land. We must have it. We must have control of it. And we don't care what happens to, to the Palestinians. No, we have to come to an agreement. We have to come to a concept of the, the benefit of the other. If we don't do it, we don't do it with regard to Israel and Palestine. There's, there's just mass murder and death. If we don't do it with regard to Russia and NATO and NATO and China, and let me tell you, it's massive propaganda on a daily basis for decades, well, for the last decade in particular, in the United States. I mean, some of the most vocal voices calling for an end to the war in Ukraine in the, in the US are people who said, we've got to get ready to attack China. This is insanity. The world cannot exist if that is the the map. So when when Mrs. LaRouche identified these ten principles, first was national sovereignty, and she referred to the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Second is the priority has to be elimination of poverty. Third was to increase, create an international healthcare system to imp to raise the uh, uh, life expectancy globally. I don't remember all the numbers, but the one was point was the creation of a financial system to increase the living standards of the less developed countries and the living standards of the poor in the developed countries. Now, getting to the most important principles, I think, the last principle was that we must assume that the human race is human beings are fundamentally good. And through development of their capacities of reason, they can improve their conditions and their, their mastery of nature. And in order to do that, the, the policies of governments have to be in correspondence it's with the lawfulness of the universe, the principles of the universe. Mankind exists because it can discover new principles of how the universe operates, like the discovery of the principle of nuclear power. Now, it is up to us to use the wisdom, to have the wisdom to use it for good instead of for destroying ourselves. But you have to know, how does the world work? And this also goes to the... Uh, the, the propaganda about uh, population. You might recall the book that was published in the 70s that came out of MIT, which is right down the street from where I am right now, Limits to Growth. They argued that world population is, uh, overpopulation was the number one issue. It's funny that you have these academics at MIT talking about the number one issue is population reduction. And then over at the National Security Council, and the State Department, 
You have top secret memos calling for population reduction in the nations of India, Brazil, Egypt, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and, and many others. It's not science. It's propaganda. It, it's, a, it's a policy of population reduction, just like Adam Smith and Thomas Malthus. It's natural for human beings, uh, as uh, Charles Schwab was, I mean, not Charles, Carl Schwab was complaining to want to improve their standards of living, to invest in new technology, to give their children a better future than they had. Those are things that everyone can agree on. It's interesting. Yeah, thank you very uh, we much. We had a discussion. We, let me just say real quick. Uh, we had a discussion last Saturday that sh showed two contrasting presentations uh, regarding President Kennedy. One was how he was insisting that the U.S. get to the moon first in 1962 so that we beat the Russians. Then, of course, you had the Cuban Missile Crisis. By June of 1963, he gave a famous speech, 10, 1963, where he said, we have got to come to a modus vivendi with the Soviet Union because we all breathe the same air. We share the same planet. We all cherish the future for our children and we are all mortal. Where he said, we have got to cooperate with the Soviet Union to prevent the possibility of nuclear war. And then in September of 1963, less than two months before he was assassinated, he called for a joint U.S.-Soviet space mission to, to go to the moon. That's what he was, he had changed. He had changed in his thinking. Instead of cooperation, I mean, instead of competition, cooperation. That's the world that we have to work toward. Thank you very much indeed, so, Bill, for this uh, yeah, detailed answer. I have a question from Thomas Duffin before coming to Richard Olufemi and Manuel, and I would like to read it as he wrote it. I understand that uh, Lyndon LaRouche supported the Ukraine invasion by Putin in 2014. As chair of the World International Wisdom Forum, I have taken a strong stand against the catastrophic invasion of Ukraine in 2022 against all the international legal and moral norms. Does forcing 4 million women and children into exile, leading to catastrophic famine across Africa, and killing countless Ukrainian civilians and young men seem justified to your LaRouche movement? Have you studied carefully the critique of Lyndon LaRouche's thinking as given in the book by Professor Tim Snyder, The Road to Unfreedom? LaRouche may have been right about some things. For example, the need to critically investigate 9-11. But was he not also wrong about some things? Was he actually a peace thinker at all? If so, what exactly did he write about peace per se? Question, question asked by Dr. Thomas Duffin, Chair World Intellectuals Wisdom Forum and Director International Institute of Peace Studies and Global Philosophy. Would you like to respond to that, Bill or okay, David? Well, I, I, let me say about Ukraine. As I mentioned, the United States sponsored a coup to remove the uh, democratically elected government of uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Earlier, before that coup came to fruition, there's public addresses by Victor Victoria Newland, who was an undersecretary of state of the US, that the United States uh, privately and governmentally had spent something like $5 billion to, to quote, encourage democracy in Ukraine, i.e. $5 billion into one of the poorest countries of Europe 
to turn the political process in Ukraine against Russia. That's what the United States was doing as a prelude to the coup. Viktor Yanukovych would have been killed by the far right nationalists that led the violent phase of that coup, which uh, created the government that we're looking at now. And, you know, I'm not responsible, and Mr. Luge isn't responsible for the, or, or wasn't responsible for the um, national security of Russia. But let's go back to 1991. Is it not true that it was promised that NATO wouldn't move east? Is it not true that the it concerns expressed by President Putin for, for that period stop moving east, stop developing uh, ballistic missile defense to give yourself an advantage of a first strike. We absolutely will not tolerate Ukraine and NATO. These were ignored. But what I don't understand is Lyndon LaRouche died in 2019. I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, expression on his part in favor of a, a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, did I misunderstand the question? Guarantees. What was going on? Um, after the coup in 2014, uh, the the new uh, ultra nationalist government started a campaign of of military aggression against its own citizens, the the, the citizens of Ukraine who were Russian speaking and had uh, a Russian cultural background. They they'd been there forever. Uh, but the, the the new government in Kiev wanted to drive them out or kill them. I don't remember how many, what was that, something like 14,000 Ukrainians were killed by the, the government in Kiev over a period of, of seven years, uh, you no know, more than that, uh, eight, I guess it's eight years. Of, of this uh, uh, military aggression before Russia in, invaded Ukraine to stop it. Uh, I'm not I'm not endorsing the Russian invasion. That's that was not the the best solution. But they, uh, w one has to grant that Russia was hard pressed, uh, and um, all, all you can say about Larouche La is that he he uh, understood what was happening to the to the the Ukrainians of Russian culture, uh, and he and he, he denounced that, but it, he did not propose that anybody go to war with anybody else. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much. I, I, wanna, I got cut off uh, while I was talking. I just I want I did want to make one point because uh, because the uh, Thomas. Uh, that had raised the objections about LaRouche, et cetera. He, he mentioned that millions of people fled Ukraine. Well, uh, if you look at the statistics, the country where most of the, the, the highest number of refugees from Ukraine fled to is Russia. I mean, what does that tell you? Thank you so much. And uh, now that we are almost really out of time, but I would like to make sure that at least the three people who have raised their hands, we can hear their comments or questions. So if we can quickly go to Richard, thank you for waiting. And then Olufemi oh. and then Manuel. Richard, please. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon from Ghana. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, please, uh, 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 I heard the, 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 the support that BRICS uh, is trying to give uh, uh, Africa. And then, 
But I would want to ask, when such high organs meet, how and where do they place their respective culture in terms of growth and development? I know that culture is independent, irrespective of where it originates. Therefore, we pair, we pair culture, but we don't merge them. So can uh, 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 our leaders uh, uh, trying to merge culture, culture, for example, trying to uh, bring technology, high technology, and then forget their, 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 their simple way of life. Are, are they, can't that this bring conflict, you see? So, uh, 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 um, not that I, 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 I know, uh, not that I believe that is what, uh, 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 excuse me, um, I believe leaders should at times think of their culture. When such meetings, such high level meetings are, uh, 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 what is it, organized, or when they, they, they join such groups, they should think of their culture and then the new culture that they want to, what, uh, 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 parallel uh, way. Thank you. And probably as they think about uh, that question on culture, if I may also ask Olufemi and, and, and Manuel to ask their questions or make their comments. Olufemi, please. Uh, thank you very much, George. Mine is not a question, it's just, um, I just want to contribute a little. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for this, to the speakers for the insights they have given. My, I just want to say that um, Klaus Schwab's admonition not to allow Africa to develop is just putting into writing what the global North has practiced over the years. For those of us in the humanitarian sector and development sector, we noticed that the difference in the way development aid was to Africa was operationalized compared to the way it was operationalized in Europe that the Second World War is totally different. Development aid grew from the martial aid that was given to Europe after the Second World War. But what did we see in Africa? We saw a totally different operationalization and African countries became the worst for it. Let us um, note that neoliberalism still holds sway in economic theory all over the world. And once the liberalism still holds sway, there is no way that any global currency, any new global currency that will be created will make any difference. There will always be a currency that is highly more convertible to that new global currency compared to other currencies within the same currency fold. And that country with the highest um, convertibility becomes the new United States. So where are we? Back to the same square, back to the beginning. I've always believed that um, the future of Africa is in Africa, not in the global north, not with Brazil, not with Russia, not with China. In fact, China even, for a lot of people, for the academics, China presents another case study. Schwab wrote that China considers Africa to be the next major manufacturing hub after the Southeast Asian opportunities have dried up. I'm quoting from Schwab. And then um, China has done, has done a lot of investments in um, Kenya, Angola, and Ethiopia, major recipients of African investments, of China's investments. But then, do we still notice that what China takes out of Africa are still raw materials? And as long as what Africa exports is raw materials, Africa can never grow. Africa will never grow. So, why does China still purchase raw materials from Africa? China just wants to supplant. It's the US in, South, in Africa. But as African leaders, have they ever thought about that? Have they ever thought about value adding our goods? Nestle is the biggest um, chocolate producing factory, sorry, um, company. Switzerland does not grow a single tree of cocoa. But Nestle sells the highest in them chocolates. What is happening? So the future of Africa is in Africa. It's not with BRICS, it's not with any global currency. Africa is large enough for African trade. We need African trade within Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you can go to Manuel, 
And then also the speakers will reply to all the questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be very, very brief because we're running out of time. Uh, on, the, on the last comment, just let me add the issue of fisheries, fisheries uh, and the uh, Chinese uh, predation of uh, African fisheries uh, is a huge problem. Um, but I, I wanted to make a comment and a very and, and a very quick question. The comment is regarding the BRICS acronym. I just wanted to comment that it's the tragedy of acronyms. Uh, we we had also <laughs> the tragedy of the LGBT LGBT acronym. Now it's it's a uh, it's a mile long. So maybe BRICS will have a, a very interesting uh, acronym in the future. And the question is is really more. A question to myself, but I, I wanted to share with you as, <clears throat> as a sort of European, as long as you know, Portugal is, you never know where Portugal is, it's Africa or Europe, but let's say I'm in the European Union, so I'm, I'm an European. Uh, to Europeans and, you know, uh, as a European or as an American, what is, you know, what what should be what should be the stance in this discussion uh, because the temptation is great to 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 shape the discourse and to lecture and to interpret but um, you know i don't know it, to the extent uh, europeans and americans uh, should have a, a position in this in the in this in this discussion that uh, that goes beyond uh, listening, and I'm I'm very you know I like to listen. I'm I'm uh, I don't know this. I have a, a problem with uh, with 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 talking about bricks because I should be listening to 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 people from Africa, from Asia, from South America more than I than speaking myself. So I wanted to share this with you. Thank you very much, and uh, I would like now to ask. Uh, David Cherry and Bill Ferguson to reply and also make their closing remarks so that we end for today. Thank you very much for you all for your patience. Well, I'd like to uh, address a couple of those points. Um, first of all, uh, about culture, uh, I think it's very important for, for uh, any culture to develop itself. And uh, yes, there will be, as a result of the BRICS kind of activity, there will be a uh, meeting of the minds uh, uh, on certain issues and there will be a kind of a, a cultural layer where there is a degree of merging, but <clears throat> We don't have to live with one culture. We, if you've lived in one country and then lived in another, you you, you may wind up with two hundred percent of culture. <laughs> so, uh, the, one's one's national culture or, or regional culture should be preserved and developed. The very highest achievements of that culture should always be should always be. Uh, 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 emphasized and developed further uh, and uh, I BRICS is going to do what it does but I don't think that it's a good idea for and I don't think that anybody in BRICS conceives that that we need to uh, merge all cultures that, that doesn't that doesn't go anywhere <laughs> now about um, currency um, that people have talked about having a single currency, but uh, that is a, that's not a good idea either. Uh, what you want is a common trading currency that uh, alongside the uh, independent currencies of the various nations. Otherwise, uh, if you have just a, a single common currency, it's always a, a, a creates tremendous pressure on the poorest, on the poorest countries. So, um, as far as 
uh, the relationship of Europeans and Americans to BRICS. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, the way I and my colleagues look at it is that the United States has to change itself. The United States has to has to uh, adopt the the um, much or most or maybe all of the of the BRICS outlook for its own good and and for the good of the world because otherwise the United States has the power to, to screw up then destroy the efforts of BRICS. That has to stop. Um, I'll just uh, stop there. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I don't see uh, the development of, well, electrification and industrialization. Um, exploring space is being contradictory to any culture. I think these are the common aims of mankind. Um, and it's, if the human, if the human race is to have any kind of future, that's going to be the basis on which we cooperate. I think that the economic policy of China toward Africa has been on on the basis of uh, the principle, one of the principles of the Belt and Road that Xi Jinping has insisted on is win-win cooperation. They've built high-speed railroads, modern railroads, uh, power plants, ports. I, I, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's in the ten, order of tens of thousands of new industries that have been invested in and created in Africa with financing from the Chinese. Um, there's a lot of records as to, if you want to look at who, who, who is Africa indebted to? If you look, you compare what Africa has to pay back to China relative to what Africa has to pay back to the countries of the IMF system, I, I don't think there's any comparison. But the most important aspect is the investments that China are making are going to benefit the nations of Africa, the people of Africa, to help raise their standard of living. And I think the whole BRICS process in general recognizes that nations should be, treat each other as equals. I mean, they're different. Uh, obviously, you know, India and China, the massive proportions of the population. But that doesn't make them superior to Ethiopia that has 100 million people. You have to respect national sovereignty. That's that was the first principle for security and development. But you also have to cooperate, and you have to have the idea of I, I said this before the benefit of the other, and. Um, this, I think some of this was mentioned in some of the, the verbal questions, but it also has been popping up in the, in the chat. This, and, and Dave mentioned about the, saying that climate change is a hoax. Now, there were excuses in the 1800s. It was acceptable to say that, well, in, in, the, in the northern countries, they said that Africans and Asians and South Americans indigenous peoples, uh, people of Arab extraction, et cetera, were inferior. And that was given as an excuse to prevent their development. That became less fashionable in the 20th century. But then the ex excuse was, I mean, if you look at Bertrand Russell's writings, he says that the populations of, of Negroes and Asians are growing much faster than the white races, and that the white races must defend themselves against this rapid population growth by methods which are disgusting, even if they are necessary. One of the ways you do that is you convince people that growth, development in uh, less developed countries is a threat to the environment as a whole. Remember, I. I I mentioned limits to growth that was published in 1970. It's a hoax. 
It was designed to argue for population control and population reduction. And it became a national security priority for the United States. And then we have climate change. There are reasons that uh, climate changes. Climate's always changing. There are historical periods where the climate in one region is very different from what it is now. The reasons for that is not carbon dioxide by human activity. There are the activity of the soul of, of the uh, the sun has an effect on the climate. Uh, cosmic radiation, which varies depending on the relative position of the solar system in the galaxy. These have effects on the cloud formation and moisture in the atmosphere. The solution to problems that humanity faces, and I agree with Ramaphosa, the number one problem is hunger and poverty and lack of development. The way you solve those problems is with science. You invest in science, you increase mankind's power. One thing that you don't hear from those who are worried about uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, why don't they advocate nuclear power? That doesn't put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Or as Ramaphosa pointed out at the summit in Paris in June, why don't you invest in the Grand Inga Dam? Here in, in Africa, we have 600 million people with no access to electricity. Why don't you help us with this massive hydroelectric dam? That doesn't produce carbon dioxide. This is me commenting on that. A hydroelectric power system that's going to provide electricity with no carbon emissions, plus it's going to provide irrigation support to, to 12 to 15 African countries. If you're interested in preventing climate change, why don't you invest in that? So science can solve problems. Science should not be used, and there shouldn't be propaganda saying that in order to save the human race, we've got to let a whole chunk of it die. Because that's in effect what uh, Klaus Schwab is saying. That's cultural pessimism. That is probably the biggest problem that we have pessimism about humanity. Mrs. Thank LaRouche you. insisted in that the most important principle in, uh, for peace, security, and development is that mankind is fundamentally good and can improve himself and his conditions through scientific discovery. That's what India just demonstrated to the world. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, thank you, Claudette. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. This has been really a wonderful conference, and we have learned, I, for one, has, have learned a lot. And I would like to welcome you again next week. In fact, I'm glad that Bill talked, touched upon the questions of climate change. And I'd like to welcome you because the topic for next Wednesday, the same time, will be renewable energy, the nexus with climate change and security in Africa with uh, Susan Mwangi and Joseph Njoroge from Kenyatta University. So you are welcome to join us. Thank you again for joining Global Peace. I wish you all the best. Thank you, Dr. Mutalemwa. Thank you, thank you. Bye bye, bye bye. Great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, bye -bye. thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Many thanks for our speakers. Indeed. Thank you. And for you, George, for leading. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Peter. Bye, Ron.